in a row he didn't. This part seems really immature in that area, yeah. So we've got a red and of course, but we know that. So every day sit down, look at your planner, so what you got, now put it on your desk. Okay, now go get your backpack. Now put Good morning, Lamb of God. How is everybody today? But, but they're nice. Are you ready you know? for some football? Keep plugging away. We love it. Thank you. We got a football yeah. fan over there. We're going to talk a little football this morning. I know Tim's a cross-country coach, but we're going to talk football. You know, every weekend, millions and millions of people are watching football games and they're tailgating and they're, you know, dressing up and goofy things and painting their faces and all that stuff. And and uh, uh, and I was reminded this morning that years ago I had the opportunity to hear the great Bo Schembechler, who was the University of Michigan football coach, speak at a conference that I was at. Um, and what made this kind of more special was the night before Woody Hayes had died. It wasn't very special for Woody Hayes, but um, uh, and Woody Hayes had passed away, and so Bo Schemmacher that morning was just telling a lot of different Woody Hayes stories and just football stories that he talked about. So he talked to us for probably about an hour that morning, and so it was just kind of neat stuff. And, got his autograph and got, got to talk to him and he talked about how he and Woody were friends and then they were, you know, just basically almost enemies on the football field. But one of the things that Bo Schembechler talked about, which I still remember to this day, was that he was at a conference, and for those of you who don't know, whether it's cross-country coaches or football coaches or basketball coaches, they have all kinds of conferences they go to. And, other coaches will speak at these conferences. In this particular one, there was a guy that was speaking about this fantastic offense that he had. And that, that it just had, was going to revolutionize the game of football. And it was just totally unique to anything that had ever been done before. And Bo Schembechler said, I sat there through the whole thing and I was just confused. So I went up to him afterwards and I said to him, Oh, wait a minute, you're talking about this great offense that you have, but you guys only had three wins all last year. What's the deal? If it was such a great offense, and he said, well, it's really pretty simple. We didn't block and tackle very well. And if you're a football fan, there are basics that you have to do, right, Charlie? If you don't block and tackle, you're not going to be a very good football team. And just like in football, blocking and tackling is an essential basic to the success of your team, there's some basics that are essential to your growth as a Christian. So what are some of those basics? Praying daily, reading God's Word daily, tithing on a, on a regular basis, <coughs> listening to Him, spending time just listening to God to say, God, what are you showing me today? What are you trying to tell me today? So there's just some basics in football that lead to success, and there are basics in our Christian walk that lead to success also. Without those basics, you're going to find that your Christian walk is going to be an up and down thing and not very consistent. So I'm a pretty simple guy, right, Chan? I'm not too broke. So, so we have to keep things pretty simple for me. And so for me, it's really simple. If I do the basics, then I've got a pretty successful and a pretty consistent walk with God. And in Proverbs, um, one of my favorite Proverbs, it says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. And I consider basics and faithfulness to be really interchangeable. And it says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them in your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and of man. So if you're struggling with your Christian walk, work on those basics. Just the praying to God every day, reading God's word, tithing, worshiping him, just spending time one-on-one -on -one with God, that quiet time to say, God, what are you showing me today? 
And one of those basics is worship. So arise with me this morning. Let's get excited about what God is doing in, in all of our lives today. And uh, we're just excited that Patrick and all the, the other folks here are just giving of their time and uh, to, uh, to just to, to worship God, to lead you in to that special place this morning. In Jesus' name. Raging, rising, eyes are turning to you. These eyes Praise is right. 
Lord. We thank you that you paid the price, God. We thank you that through our weakness, God, that you are strong, Lord. You are our strength, God. The joy of the Lord is our strength, God. We thank you that we can lean on you as our strength, God, as we take joy in you. Today is the day that you've made, God. We will rejoice in you, God. I am the Savior's say. Thy strength indeed is gone. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy calling call. Cause Jesus paid it all. And go to him, my Lord. The sin that left the crimson stain He washed it by His
presence here this morning. We thank you that you are our provider, our protector, our redeemer. You're the great I am. And Lord, we look to you for all things, all things today. We trust in you. We follow you. We thank you, Lord, for your presence here. And uh, Lord, may we continue to be drawn closer to you. May those areas of our lives that we've been holding back from you or afraid to trust in you, may we turn all those areas over to you today. As we just see your faithfulness to us, your love toward us, your grace that covers us, Lord, may it just build up that, that trust that we can turn all of our lives over to you, every part, every area. Lord, just thank you. Thank you for your kingdom. Thank you for your rule and your reign in our lives and in our world. We look to you today, Lord. We give you thanks in all things. Thank you, Lord. I just want to uh, share a scripture with you that God put in my heart uh, this morning. It's uh, out of Psalm 118, and David is writing this, and he says, I was pushed back and about to fall, uh, but the Lord helped me. Uh, when he's talking about about to fall, he's talking about about to be killed. So he was pushed back and about to be killed, and he says, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He has become my salvation. The Lord has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. Then he says this, I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. I will not die but live and proclaim what the Lord has done. And this morning, I just uh, feel, uh, you know, led to say, I believe God is saying to us that certainly if you have a life-threatening sickness or disease, certainly that is to be the cry of your heart, that you will reach out to Him today. He is our healer. By the stripes on His back, the Bible says we are healed. And we are striving to lay hold of all the promises of God. We, 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 we fight the good fight of faith, right? We strive forward for what God has has purchased for us in Christ Jesus. And so there is this, there is this intentional, determined, warrior kind of mindset that says, I'm going to be all that God has called me to be. And I'm going to have all that God has purchased for me. And today I just want to encourage you. The Bible says, and the Spirit of God came upon David and he says, I will not die but live. Okay, but live. I'm going to live. God is all about life. He's not about death. Right? He's about resurrection and, and hope. And I will proclaim what the Lord has done. And that is that is that is what God's speaking to you today. But also, I believe it's beyond that for, for many of us in this room. It is the areas of our lives that have just died. It's the hope or it's the dreams or it's the parts of our life that we've given up on or relationships that we've given up on or things that we just kind of and we just kind of said, well, I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to be that. I'm never whatever. And we're not living. We're not really living. You know what I'm saying? We're not really living what God has called us to, to live. And it, and I just believe the Spirit of God wants to breathe fresh fire into your belly today, into your spirit today. That says, and that you would agree with Him and say, you know what? That's enough's enough. I will not die, but live. And I will proclaim what the Lord has done in my life. And there is a great... Uh, in God's creating you for such a time as this and putting you where you are. There is a great purpose in your life and the, the devil wants to steal that purpose and destiny and that hope and that excitement and that adventure that you have with God. And you are the only one that God made to do what you, he's called you to do. And, uh, and we are the people of God. We're not going to shrink back and be destroyed. But we're going to we're going to step forward, right? We're going to fight forward. And we're going to lay hold of the promises of God for our lives. And the Spirit of God is saying to you today, let Him arise within you and you declare, I will not die, but live. I'm going to live. You know what I mean? Like really live. Live out of Him and out of the destiny that God has for my life. And uh, there's no addiction that can stand up to the name of Jesus. There's no bondage. There's no hurt or pain that can shackle you if you come to God, you give it to God. You, you just release it to Him. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying you don't have to die. You can live. There's life in Jesus. He is our Savior. He's our Redeemer. He's one who paid for the, the price for you to be free and to be whole.
soul. And uh, he is life for you. He said, I came to give you life abundantly. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. And when we, uh, when we come forward here in a moment to receive communion, that's the kind of spirit I, I pray will rise up within you, the spirit of God within you, that you'd lay hold of those saints for which Christ has laid, laid hold of you. That's what Paul says. I'm not done yet. I haven't arrived yet, but I'm, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm forgetting about what, what my past was like because I'm redeemed. I'm forgetting about the things that held me back. And I'm pressing on and I'm straight for to grab a hold of everything for which God in Christ Jesus grabbed a hold of me. Every promise of God is yes and amen in Jesus Christ. We need to say the amen. He's already said the yes. We need to agree with God. We need to lay hold by faith of the promises of God. And so I just, I just pray this morning you'd hear what the Spirit is saying to you that he, God didn't destine you to die. He destined you to live. He didn't destine you to just survive or make it. He destined you to be abundant. Abundant life. Full of life. Full of purpose. Full of fruit. That your life matters. And uh, and I, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you, you're the only one that can do this. But that you would breathe life into our into us, Lord. Bring, breathe life, fresh fire into our spirits this morning, Lord. Awaken us to the things that we have surrendered over time through discouragement or uh, hurt uh, or distraction and awaken those things in us today Lord that we would come fully alive into the destiny that you have for us to live life as moms and dads grandmas, grandpas, sons, daughters citizens, football players whatever, cross country runners employers, business owners residents of Clyde or Montrose or Bertrand wherever we live in our neighborhood, in our families awaken up, us Lord, up. to the great destiny you have for our lives yeah, and bring yeah. fresh fire upon us today that what the enemy has tried to steal from us trying to squander trying to suppress trying to harass Lord that you would restore you would renew in us today yes, and we Lord. look to yes, you Lord. Jesus and for those here in this place battling disease physical disease Lord we declare over them you will not die but live but live may the resurrection power of Jesus Christ that lives inside of us rise up in these bodies now and consume and swallow up death and destruction and decay and may the life of God be injected into each person here today by faith in Jesus Christ the one who purchased our healing on the cross with his shed blood and the stripes on his back in Jesus name so Lord we come to receive and we come to place our faith in you Thank you, Lord, today, today, in Jesus' name, the one who saves. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to just continue to worship. And uh, if you have a gift to give this morning, we're going to first collect our offering, and then the ushers will lead you up to have communion together today. And if you have a prayer card, you can put that in the, in the uh, offering plate as well. And let's just, we're always giving out of an abundance, or always giving out of a thanksgiving for what God has done for us, okay? Amen.
So why don't you go ahead and be seated? And uh, this was not planned, but it's just things are happening. Isn't that cool? And uh, just want to point here. We can do a couple. I know two already. So let's just start right back. I apologize if I start to cry. Introduce um, yourself and then tell us what guys I'm Vicki, by the way, um, aka <coughs> Trouble. Um, oh, no. <laughs> I stay safe. Um, back in 2009, for health reasons, I decided to go on disability. And um, I had what I figured my plans. And I was going to do X, Y, and Z, and I was going to get off from disability. And, Two years. Well, it's been four years. And I'm still on disability. And um, I didn't pay my house taxes because I didn't have the money. And I got a foreclosure notice from the county. And um, I prayed about it and I talked to one sibling about it. She turned it over to her brother who. He put some things in action and put some of things down on paper. And uh, he was going to help me, and then he backed up the last second. And um, it's the family home. It's where we all grew up. And I um, turned to the Lord, and I said, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but you're just going to have to do it because I can't. And um, to make a long story short, my back... Taxes was $3,000. I'm now under $1,000. And this year's summer taxes are paid. And um, I don't have cable. I drive a 99 car. I limit my gas. But you know, the Lord's blessed me. I'm able to take friends to doctor's appointments and, um, and be a witness. And um, I know he has more for me, so I ask you to pray for me that um, I'll walk where he wants me to walk. And um, I just praise him. Let's pray for our sister Lord, and just pray for the cry of her heart, Lord, right now that she would be able to walk where you call her to walk and do what you call her to do and be who you call her to be and that she would discover more and more uh, of her capacity to trust in you growing in her life every day. We just celebrate, Lord, that you have been with her and that you're helping her uh, financially. And, Lord, we just bless our sister today. And, may, and, Lord, we know that as she continues to follow you, you are going to take care of everything. You're going to meet every need that she has. And we bless our sister now in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. 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 You want to share what God's done for you, Mary? My name is Mary Howell. This summer, I was diagnosed with cancer. I've never been a sick a day in my life. Never been in the hospital. So this came out of the blue. And um, they found it in May. And God walked with me every step of the way. Because I was so, I wasn't scared. But he gave me such peace to go through everything because I didn't know what I was facing. I didn't know about surgeries. I didn't know about blood work or nothing. You know? So, anyways, in June, um, they did the biopsy and uh, it was cancerous. And in July 12th, I had surgery. Um, there was no lymph nodes that were cancerous. They had clear parameters, and I am cancer free today. Is there a couple others I wanted to share today? Anything that's going on? God's doing it in your life? which is a digestive disorder and it can be very painful, very hard to cope at times. And um, last, last spring was a very, the last, I'm a teacher, very um, hard 
last two weeks of school pretty much in order to get through the last two weeks I pretty much couldn't eat. And um, and I knew that this wasn't looking good to be able to go back to work next year. And I've had seven colonoscopies now and every year they've talked about how I've gotten worse, gotten worse. And um, they transferred me onto uh, high risk for colon cancer. And I was reaching a point where um, the doctor told me you're, you're not looking at very good options as you continue getting worse, which were one of them is a form of chemotherapy where they destroy your immune system since it's an autoimmune thing, or just removing you know parts of your insides. And um, so my husband had found a, a book called Eat to Live. And he said, you know, I'm going to try this. And uh, I just felt like, just it just felt like at times food was my enemy. And uh, so for, I started looking into eating, I mean, just totally different. Just, I didn't have a whole lot of options left. So I started um, looking at some alternative, like, very different types of a medical massage, uh, things like that. And I was lined up for another colonoscopy in August, and I saw the my doctor the day before, and I told him everything I had been doing, and I said, I am actually feeling better than I've ever felt. I didn't, when you progressively get sicker and sicker, you don't, you don't always realize how sick you feel <laughs> until all of a sudden you start to feel better. And, um, I remember kind of waking up, and he said to me, he said, Denise, you have never looked this good before. And he said, I thought I was probably going to have to tell you that we going to have to do a lot, you know, just, and he said, I don't think I need to do another scope or see you again with, with how much you have improved for three to five more years. And every year I was getting a diagnosis and I was worse. So I, I have been able to go back to work these two weeks and truly enjoy being with the kids in my class wow. instead of worrying about, you know, running to a restroom or I shouldn't eat today in order to get through my day. And it has just, God designed a way for us to eat. God has, I mean, he really laid out a good plan for us if we, and I'm just thankful that my, you know, my husband found that and how much it has truly, you know, restored my insides. <laughs> so, anyways. <laughs> But they got an advanced 
uh, hormone medicine that he needed to have because his was more advanced because he was overseas, he didn't realize how bad it was. And uh, so he's been going through a process of taking that medicine and we just found out recently that um, it's down to less than one, his PSA score now. And uh, so that is moving. He's still got to here the early December uh, for surgery. And uh, I don't know what they'll do about the cancer and everything, but uh, but he's coming along. He's in Houston this weekend for more tests to determine, you know, if he's ready for surgery. And in the midst of this, uh, see, about June, we found out our oldest son, we have three sons, is, um, and Ted was the middle one, our oldest son has had a heart problem with his valve, uh, air, and uh, they said he can't wait any longer. He had to have surgery. So July 30th, he had surgery, and his valve, come to find out when they had to give him open heart surgery, was very badly deformed, and they had to put a, a new uh, valve on it. But they also had to take out part of his aorta and replace that because it was so bad. And uh, But we were really praying for him and everything. And of course, we had Ted and his family here for more tests. But then Mike started having all kinds of complications. One thing read up, another went wrong. He, had, uh, he started bleeding and he had fluid leakage. And uh, they had to do transfusions and rush him back into surgery. And then he, his heart started, uh, the rhythm wasn't going right. And uh, we just, we were just around the clock, it seemed like, in prayer here. And within two or three days after my son left with his family, we flew down to Houston. I don't know how we did it. We packed in two days and got down there. And, uh, but he's doing good. He's coming out of it. I mean, everything that could go wrong went wrong, but God brought him through everything. God is so good. He's so faithful, you know, and he's been taking care of us, and I know he's going to carry us all through it. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to uh, just give an opportunity right now. If you're here and, and uh, you just need prayer, we want to just pray for you. If you're dealing with something, you're in the middle of one of the storms, uh, you know, and just, just really looking for, for God to intervene, to do what only God can do, we just want to pray for you. If that's you, right now, if you would just stand and the rest of us want to just bless you with some prayer, okay? And if someone is standing near you, then we want to, uh, if someone's near you, please go to them. We want a couple of people just put place a hand on their shoulder, and we just want to encourage each other. So does everybody have someone? There's some people in the back over here too. Would someone go over there? And just a, just as a representation of all of us together, we want a hand on the shoulder just to represent Jesus and uh, in all of us as a family. And uh, you can begin to pray just quietly right there personally as I just lead us also in prayer. Lord, we just lift our brother and our sister to you. We pray for our family this morning. Lord, in the midst of the storms that we're facing, we look to you, Jesus, the one who saves. And we place our hope and our trust and our faith in you. And Lord, we pray for you to deliver, you to heal, you to direct, you to break in our circumstances and alter them and bring them under your lordship, your headship, whether it's physical or emotional or financial or mental or any of these areas, Lord, that's pertaining to their, their particular situation. We just pray for your kingdom to come, yes. your will to be done, for things to come back into order, bodies to be under order, your order, finances under your order, uh, relationships under your order, our thoughts under your order. Lord, we are looking to you. Lord, we look to you. We just offer it to you, Lord, and we pray a blessing and encouragement right now. With these hands that we are touching, may they feel your hand. May they feel your love, your compassion, your uh, your grace coming upon their lives right now. In Jesus' name, to speak the Spirit of God to quicken in each one, our brother and sister, that faith will arise. And uh, Lord, encouragement right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We are looking for you, Lord, to have your kingdom bear upon each and every one of our lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. It says that there's shouts of victory in the tents of the righteous. Shouts of victory. That we called out to the Lord, and he heard my prayer, and he answered. 
And we are, de we are declaring today that we will not die, but live and tell of all the great things that God has done in our lives. And we bless our brother, our sister right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Just say those words, I bless you, before you let them go, okay? Just speak, I bless you, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Awesome. Let's thank, thank our worship team, too, for all the great stuff that you have done. This week, uh, we have a special service planned for Wednesday night. There's a little card in there uh, for a reminder, but it's Pastor Dwayne Vanderclock from Granville, and uh, we're really excited to have him coming. He comes usually once or twice a year, and it's on a Wednesday night. Uh, just to encourage you to make it easier for your schedule if you need to, to do something quick for dinner. We are going to have pizza here at 530, and if that works for your schedule, um, you can get tickets for pizza. It helps us know how much pizza to order. And it's $5 a person or $10 for a family. And uh, so you can do that today before you leave. But hope that you can make it Wednesday night. The service will be at 630. And he always uh, has got such a great encouraging word from God for us when he comes. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, and also, today I wanted to just share a few few minutes with you on the series that we've been talking about. When you have your folder on the outside of it, it says the seven appointed times of God. And in the scriptures, in Leviticus chapter 23, we've been looking at these seven different appointed times of God. The Moedim, the appointed times of God. And God says, I am putting these times on my calendar. Meet me here. Okay, that's literally what he's saying. Meet me on these days, every year, meet me. Now, of course, we have a weekly appointed time with God. It's Sunday morning. See, he said that the Sabbath is an appointed holy day that we get to meet with God, that he calls us to assemble and worship him. But these seven special times throughout the year in, in the, in the you know, history of, of Israel are festivals and feasts that are celebrated. And it is, as we've studied the scripture in light of what Jesus it is God's full redemptive plan for mankind in the shadows. It's like God kind of shows these things, but then in Christ we begin to understand what they really mean and the significance of them. So we've been going through these seven, and today we are starting the seventh of the seventh feasts. This is the granddaddy of them all. All right, this is the big enchilada. Because in, in Scripture, seven is a really important number. It represents completion or fullness. Uh, based on the seven days of creation. So you have seven days of creation, and after seven, it was all finished. And when it was finished, God looked and said, man, I did a good job. It looks good. That's good. You're good. You know, he said, you're really good. And he created you. He created me. And so uh, in the scripture, seven is always a very significant number because it represents the fullness, the completed package. And so seven feasts are God's full complete, redemptive plan for you, for me, and for this world. So the last couple weeks have been talking about that. And today's feast is called the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the finale rally of God, gathering all the nations together. All the nations together. It is foreshadowing the coming of Christ and the gathering of the church, the gathering of the nation of Israel, and the gathering of the nations of the world to recognize and worship Jesus as King, where He then offers all back to God, and the fullness of the Kingdom of God is completed. And so the finale rally of God is really what the Feast of Tabernacles is foreshadowing. But I need to just give you a little context of, of the, uh, the, the feast that's found in the Old Testament, so that we can really see in the New Testament how it bursts to life for us, okay? Uh, before I do that, it is Wednesday night at sundown on our calendar here in America. The Feast of Tabernacles begins. It's a seven-day feast. It's known as the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, the, the Feast of the Ingathering, and in Hebrew it's known as Sukkot. So last uh, Friday night was Yom Kippur, and this Wednesday night, sundown, starts the Festival of Sukkot. Okay? Tabernacles. And so, uh, when you read your Bible, sometimes it talks about booths, tabernacles, and in gathering. I don't know why they have so many names for it, but because there's so much packed into the meaning of this festival. I think that's why they kept coming up with more names. All right, here's how it works. In Leviticus chapter 23, 
It says, so beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the crops in the land, celebrate the festival to the Lord for seven days. The first day is the day of Sabbath rest, and the eighth day is also a day of Sabbath rest. On the first day, you are to take branches from luxuriant trees, from palms, willows, and other leafy trees, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So they literally today, uh, when they do celebrate this festival, they, they take palm branches and some other branches, myrtle and some other uh, lemon type citrus uh, fruit, and they hold them all in their hand, and they, and they wave, and they praise God with it, according to the scriptures. And so celebrate this as a festival to the Lord for seven days each year. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In other words, do it for the end of time. Okay, do it every year, all the time. Celebrate it in the seventh month. Live in temporary shelters for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in such shelters, so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So God is saying, listen, I want you every year to celebrate and remember how I protected you, took care of you in the desert for 40 years, and though you lived in temporary shelters, I was tabernacling, I was living, I was abiding with you, and I was protecting and caring for you, and, and this is to be a reminder to you. Now, when we foreshadow that through the cross, we find out that this is representing eternity, that you and I will tabernacle with God forever. Yeah. His, His presence came down on planet Earth, for the first time on Mount Sinai, and from that moment, he began to dwell in a tabernacle among the people in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And in, the, in the, uh, Exodus, it says, by, by day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. The presence of God had a, a physical dimension to it in the desert. It was a cloud in the day. He was a cloud in the day and fire at night. Cloud to bring shade from the heat and fire to bring guidance and warmth in the in night time. I, I've, I've been told the deserts are really hot in the day and really cold at night. So the presence of God went with the people. Actually, I should say the people went with the presence of God. Because when the cloud moved, guess what the people did? Let's move! Gotta stay in the shade. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know? And and that's how many of you know it's smart to, to follow God. Right? Yeah. To go where God is leading you. If you don't follow him, uh, you know, it's not gonna be good for you. And so the people learn how to follow God every day for 40 days in the desert by cloud or by fire. And so the presence of God tabernacled among them. Now when we look ahead, we'll talk about this a little bit more next week. The Bible says that Jesus, Son of God, full of grace and truth, He came in the flesh and blood, and He dwelt among us. That word is the same word that you would say, He tabernacled among us. Isn't that beautiful? We're going to talk about that next week a little bit more. And so we have this idea of God's protecting and provision, and the people build shelters. To this day, Jewish families build little tiny shelters. Some of them are more elaborate than others. And they, they, they may cover it with, uh, they may make it out of uh, bamboo or maybe some kind of cloth walls or something. And some of them spend more time on it than others. And they spend most of these seven days in this temporary shelter as part of the celebration of remembering God has provided everything for us and he will in the future. God has protected us in the past and he will in the future. We can trust God. We can follow God. He is faithful. And they worship and give thanks to God. They eat their meals in these temporary shelters. They make a big deal out of it. This whole, this whole festival was the granddaddy of them all. It was the greatest celebration of all seven feasts and festivals. And so in, um, in Deuteronomy, it says, listen to these words. Celebrate the Festival of Tabernacles uh, after you've gathered in your produce of the threshing floor and the wine press. Be joyful at your festival. And it says you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, the Levites, the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows. Everybody is to be joyful. For seven days, celebrate this festival. And then it says, for the Lord your God will bless you in all your harvest and in all the work of your hands. And your joy will be complete. God's going to bless your, your, your harvest. He's going to bless the work of your hands. He's going to make your life fruitful. You will, you will have complete joy. When you do what? When you just follow God. 
and you acknowledge Him, and you give thanks to Him, and you worship Him, then God says, I'm going to bless your life, be fruitful, like Doug was saying at the outset. There's some basics that we must constantly do. Follow God is one of them. <laughs> when I follow God, things work out well. When I do my own thing, and I just want to do what I want to do, it doesn't work out that well. <laughs> and uh, following God, trusting Him, relying on Him, that's, that's a big deal. And then there's, a, there's one instance in Deuteronomy that happens every seven years. It's really cool. And I don't want to have time to read it, but I'm just going to describe it to you very quickly. Every seven years, during the Feast of Tabernacles, Moses was instructed by God to command the people to gather everybody together, all the Israelites, all their foreigners, all their children, everybody together for the reading of the law of God. It says, because our children need to know and they need to fear the Lord. People need to hear the word of God. And so every seven years, it was called the year of canceling debts. And then in Hebrew, it's Shemitah. Every seven years, debts were canceled. And then every seven, seven years is the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee, where there's land is restored, property is restored, everything's reset again to, to people. Because God says, it's my land, it's not your land. And, and you're not supposed to be indentured servants. You know, we're supposed to live free. And so this is really cool. On this seventh year, every year, they would read in front of all the people, the children, everybody, the Torah, the law of God. And everybody would hear it. When uh, this happened in Nehemiah, Ezra, they built a big wooden platform for him. He was up on this wooden platform. And then Nehemiah, you can read about it. He read the book of the law from morning till night. And it created a great revival in the people. Because they were cut to the heart and like, wow, we didn't realize that that's what the Word of God says, that we had drifted from this and we have drifted from that. And they and they were they, they caused them to renew their faith in God. And there's a great renewal in the people and a new commitment to the ways of God so that they can have the blessing of God in their lives. It's just a beautiful, beautiful picture of how this festival was worked out and lived out in the people. With the Word of God, the fullness of the Word of God being read. Now listen, Jesus is... The Word of God. He is the fulfillment of the complete picture. So we have seven festivals. Seven is a big deal. This is the seventh festival of seven in the seventh month with seven days. Okay? Lots of sevens. Lots of sevens. Um, one other thing I'll say is that there's a, there's a couple of different aspects to this uh, festival. One is that it is God's finale rally. The gathering of the nations. And every day they had to sacrifice bulls. So on the first day of this festival, they would sacrifice 13 bulls, according to, to what God told them to do. The next day was 12, the next day 11, 10, 9, 8, all the way down to 7 on the seventh day. Seven bulls on the seventh day of the seventh feast. <laughs> you know, you get the picture, okay? And you add all those bulls up over seven days, they will have slaughtered 70 bulls, sacrificed 70 bulls. And uh, there's legend and tradition that uh, the, the scholars, the scribes, believe there were 70 nations of the world. So when you talk about 70, it's, it's a number that all throughout history has just kind of used as to describe the complete all world, all the nations in the world. 70 nations. And there's legends that say in the, in the rabbinical readings and, and writings of the first and second century that when God came down on Pentecost, the first time the presence of God came on the earth, in that form, you know, he came down. That he spoke the word to Moses. That the, the rabbi said he spoke it in the 70 languages of the world. Okay, this is legend. That he spoke his word in the 70 languages of the world so that everybody would hear the word of God. Okay? Then you fast forward to Acts chapter 2. And when, when the Spirit came upon the believers in the upper room and they began to speak, they began to speak in all the languages of the world. Tongues is what we refer to them, but really, it was not an unknown language. They were known languages on the, on the earth. And how beautiful it was to say on the first Pentecost, the, the legend was that God had spoken in all the languages of the world. And when God poured out His Spirit, He again spoke of His own glory and of His own honor in all the languages of the world. Isn't that beautiful? And so when we see the sacrifices that God requires, it's foreshadowing that this is going to be the gathering of all the nations of the world. That God is inviting all the world back home under His protection, under His presence, under His tabernacle. Come home. 
come home, and this represents eternity, that God is gathering the world back to himself. Okay? He's gathering the nations. In Zechariah chapter 14, we're not going to read it, but you can read about how all the nations of the world will gather together, and it will be during the Feast of Tabernacles, and they will recognize the kingship of Jesus, and, and they, will, they will submit to the kingdom of God. You, you can read about it. It's pretty cool. Now, the other part of the Feast of Tabernacles that's in association with this is the worshiping of the Messiah as the King. Okay, when, when the uh, New Testament folks were celebrating this feast, there was all this messianic uh, anticipation in this feast that one day the Messiah is going to come. One day the Messiah is going to come and he's king and he's going to rule and he's going to reign. He's not going to just be the king of the Jews. He's going to be the king of everyone, everything, and every nation. That God is, because all the prophets spoke of, the Messiah would come as a king. Well, also as a servant, but also as a king. They couldn't figure out how he could do both, but we see in Jesus how he came as a servant, how he returns as a king. Right? He came as a lamb and he returns as a lion. Right. There you go. All right. So we see in Jesus' fulfillment, but they are always confused about it. But now in Jesus we can see that they were having this great anticipation that Jesus would come or the Messiah would come as king and, uh, and that he would dwell with, with them forever. So I want to talk about one tradition that developed during the Feast of Tabernacles and how Jesus fulfilled the, the Feast of Tabernacles. And next week I'm going to pick up where, where we leave off this morning and do a couple more illustrations. This is where I just love studying the Bible because I believe that to really understand the New Testament, to understand who Jesus is and what he's done for us, we have to understand uh, where it's coming from and how what he has fulfilled. So with that understanding of the Feast of Tabernacles, I'm going to share with you a tradition that developed during the feast. The priest would go into the temple, and this was during Jesus' day, this is how it would work. Every day of the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days, the, a high priest would go into the temple, take the, a golden bowl utensil, he would come out, and all the pilgrims from all over the world, and all the Jews who had gathered to Jerusalem, uh, would be singing psalms. Psalms 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, and 118. These are called the Hallel Psalms, or Psalms. And they're praises, and they're uh, anticipation of the coming of the Messiah, and they're, they're psalms that cry out for God to save, call out for God to help. And it's just beautiful. So the tradition was they began to sing these songs, and all the people would gather together. Okay, three times a year, the people, the Jewish people were commanded by Scripture to gather in Jerusalem for these festivals, Passover, the Pentecost, and this one, the Feast of Tabernacles. So the people were gathered together, pilgrims from other nations even, had come together. The priests would go with this pitcher, gold pitcher, and they would process down to the Pool of Siloam. He would dip it into the water, and then he would process back up to the temple as the crowds are following and singing these songs and crying out for God to save. Then he would walk one time around the altar, and he'd pour the water out in front of the altar on the ground, signifying that God, and he'd be praying too, that God, we are looking for you to do what only you can do, as if, a, uh, as if you would be bringing water to a dry and thirsty land. You're the only one that can do this, God. You're the only one who can save. And we're looking for you. Come. Come. Save us, God. Save us now. And the word was, and I mentioned this before, it was Hosanna, but in their language it's Hosanna. Hosanna. Save us, Lord. Save us now. Do what only you can do. You're the only one who can save, just like you're the only one who can provide water in a dry and thirsty land. Okay, so you do that every day. And every day the pilgrims would gather for this little procession. Until the seventh day. Seventh day okay, of the seventh festival in the seventh month. Guess how many times the priest walked around the altar? Seven, seven times. He's walking around the altar. He processes down, comes back. But this time the crowd is, is calling out Hoshiana. Psalm 118. It's the last song. It's the last one. In fact, I'll just open it up and see what I see. Uh, here's one that says, uh, verse 25, O oh Lord, save us. That's, that's that Hoshiana. And the other parts in here, I think it says the same thing. And so when you see, O oh Lord, save us, that's, that's Hosanna. Lord, save us. We need your help. 
And you can read that song, and they're screaming this out, and they get louder and louder every lap that the priest takes around the altar. And by the time he's done, it's just they're just crying out for God. And it's all in, in anticipation that God is someday going to save us. He's someday going to reveal the Messiah. He's someday going to make what's wrong right again in our lives. And we're looking for him to do what only he can do. And now we come to one of the most amazing uh, revelations I've ever seen from studying scripture. And I didn't, I didn't see this. I just studied it and, and, and blessed by it. But in John chapter 7, we see that Jesus attends the Feast of Tabernacles. His brothers are telling him to go, and then he says, no, I'm not going, and da 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 But then he shows up a couple days later. In John chapter 7, he arrives uh, to Jerusalem, to the temple. He goes there, and uh, he does some talking. And, uh, and I want to read for you John chapter 7, verse 37. It says, uh, On the last and greatest day of the feast, so what day is this? The seventh day of the seventh festival in the seventh month. After seven laps around the altar, the priest is pouring out the water, saying, God, do what only you can do. It says here, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, some say he shouted because everybody else is shouting. And these people are calling out for God. God, do what only you can do. You're the only one who can provide water in the thirsty land. You're the only one who can do this. And Jesus stood and shouted to the crowd. And he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Jesus recognized, and he was sharing with the people, that he alone was able to meet the needs of the people. And here's the, here's the punch I want to pack, right? 7777, completion. Jesus reveals himself, and God reveals through Jesus, that Jesus is God's complete and final and perfect redemption for mankind. He is the seven. He's the one that, he's the grand finale. He, it's in Jesus that is the finale rally of God. And it is in Jesus that he invites us to know him and to be saved. And this is a big deal to me because uh, it makes me excited. <laughs> and it builds my faith. And it reminds me that I'm not just calling out for Jesus, you know, just because he's a good guy. He is God's means of salvation for me and for you today. He is the living water that we need. He is the one that can do what only God can do. He is the means of our salvation. And his name is Yeshua. The Lord saves. The Lord saves. Now, it's not just, and again, I say this all the time, but it's not just that my sins are forgiven, but boy, really, you know, now i got to suffer through life until I die and get to heaven. No, it's not that at all. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life to the full. Right. And he came to save me, body, soul, spirit. He came to redeem me that my life on earth would be a reflection of his love for me. And so if I am able to continue to cry out, Hoshiana, Hoshiana, Jesus, save me. Today, save me, Lord. Today, he saves. He delivers. He heals. That's why we share with each other. This is what God has done for me. He has saved me. He's financially helped me. He's healed me of cancer. And, and those who stood today, our cry is, well, Shiana, God, yeah. save us. Save us now. Save me. Do what only you can do. Do what only you can do. And uh, we look to God and Him alone to bring salvation and healing and hope and, and, and wholeness to our lives. Jesus is the Savior of the world. There is no question about it. He is the living water that you and I need to drink from. Every day. Every day. And so my other part of this challenge is to consider six months later that the same people who were at this feast had reconvened for the next pilgrimage feast, which was Passover. Six months later, the people came back to Jerusalem. And this time as Jesus was entering Jerusalem, to fulfill the scriptures, he sat on a donkey. And he came into the city and the people from the last festival of Tabernacle took the palm branches 
and the myrtle tree branches. And they saw Jesus coming. And they said, Hosanna! 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 Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us, O oh God. And they're looking at Jesus. And they're worshiping him as the king. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. That was not part of the Passover festival. The leaves and the branches on that belong at tabernacles. But the people had heard him say that. And you can read about it. Some believed and some didn't believe. So I'm like, who's that guy I think he is? And I was like, he is. He's the Christ. That's the one. Who else would do the things that this guy does? And so all these people believed it. Six months later, they began to recognize that he was the Christ, the Messiah. And they worshipped him. And they waved the palm branches. And it, and it says that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. But they were looking for a different kind of a king. They were looking for a different kind of a salvation. They didn't know that he was coming to remove sin from their lives. They thought he was coming to remove the Romans from their lives. Okay? But some people who were in tune with the Spirit of God knew who he was and what he was there for. And so now today is the same for you and for me. Do we cry out for Jesus? Do we cry out, Lord, save me. Save me now. Do we come to him for our thirst to quench our soul? For the bread of life that we need substance for? Or do we just go our own way and we say, well, that's not really who he is. He's just the one that forgives me of my sins. But over here, you know, i got to go to doctors or i got to go. I'm not saying anything against doctors, but I'm saying if you want salvation in any facet of your life, ultimately it comes through Jesus. Amen. It comes through him. He's the one who saves. No matter what means he directs you through, it is from him and it's to him be all the glory and all, all the honor. And, uh, and I, my heart is to help people see Jesus. And I want to share this with you because uh, something that God's been doing in my heart lately is for a long time in my life, I, one of my main goals was to be a good person. Okay? <laughs> I, mean, I think we all want people to like us. Most of us want people to like us. But I wanted to be a good person. I thought, man, if I just be a really good person, then you know, maybe uh, that would be a good witness to people. But I, I want to tell you, I'm tired of being a good person. I'm not going to stop being a good person, but let me tell you why. I'm tired of it. Because it's got to be more than that. Yeah. I don't want to be a good person. I want to point people to Jesus. And so it's not about just being good and being loving and being kind and being joyful. Somebody needs to point people to Jesus. Somebody has to say Jesus. Someone has to get people to understand that it's not my goodness that's going to change anybody's life. It's not my good example. It's not uh, impressing anybody about the way I do things. It is if I can introduce people to Jesus. Jesus. And so I just feel like we need to begin more and more speaking about Jesus. Letting people know that Hosanna is Him. And salvation is in His name. And uh, it's only through His name that any one of us can ever be saved and forgiven of our sins and made right with God and saved of everything else that we're looking for. Now, we have people all, all over our, our world, all over our lives, all over the place. They're crying out. There's pain. There's hurt. They, don't, they haven't recognized yet that Jesus is the Messiah, that He's the Savior. But you can see it. They're crying out, God, help me. God, help me. They may not be saying those words, but they're, they're saying it with their actions. They're saying it with their lives. They're looking and they're searching for salvation. They're looking for joy. They're looking for purpose. They're looking for help. And there's crisis all around us. And what is the answer to a lost and dying world? What is the answer to those people in the middle of that crisis? The answer is Jesus. It's not a good person. It's not you just being a good person. That's great being a good person. But it's, it's Jesus in you that they need. They need Jesus. He is the Messiah. And so I just want to encourage you. Start to speak his name more. Don't hide your goodness behind, you know, hide Jesus behind your goodness. Let, let Jesus come out and say it's, it's in him. It's Jesus. You know, you need a relationship with him. He's the one who saves. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Amen. We are the bearers of good news. We are the body of Christ on the earth. We are his hands. We are his mouthpieces. We are his shoulders to cry on. We're his feet that get to do the errands. We're the ones that get to go to people and say, have you met him yet? Do you know he's here? Because I'm telling you, everybody's crying out for a Savior. Everybody needs salvation. Everybody needs Jesus. And he said, if you call out to me, if you come to me, you won't just have a pitcher of water. 
you'll have a river of living water right. flowing from inside of you that has that's tapped into you, a, a limitless well that bubbles up to eternal life. Bubbles up to eternal life. Wow. And that's when Jesus stood up and he screamed to the crowds, crying out to God. He says, he's here. Come to me. Come to me. And that's what he's saying to you and me today. Whatever, wherever we're dealing with, he's still the, he's still the same. And he still says, come to me. Yes. For rivers of living water. I want to pray for you and just pray that God would just move upon us right now. Fresh faith in the things that we're contending with. That we wouldn't give any ground up as we mentioned earlier, that God is speaking to us today to lay hold of all the promises that He has for our lives. And Jesus, we come to you right now and we just acknowledge that you are Lord and King. And we celebrate that you are the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. And it is perfect and complete in you. There is no other. There is nothing else. It's all in you. You are the final climactic finish to God's redemptive plan. And we have you. And we celebrate you. And we rejoice in you. And we place our faith in you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, stir in us a tenacity and a passion to lay hold of everything that you've laid hold of us for. That there would be anything lost at the cross in our life. That everything would be redeemed. Everything would be renewed. Everything would be restored. And Lord, that your destiny for our lives would be fulfilled and lived out to the full. That our lives would be great uh, lives of fruit because of what you've done in our lives. And Jesus, we proclaim you, we lift you up, and we declare you are Lord of Montrose. You're Lord of Clio, Lord of Urchma, St. Charles, and Flint. You're Lord of Fleshing and New Oldrup and, and, and Chestine and all of our surrounding burden, all of our surrounding communities here. You're Lord. You are Lord Jesus. We acknowledge your Lordship. And we thank you for it. Thank you that we can trust in you in all areas of our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This morning, before we go, I just want to make sure everyone here has had that opportunity to, to get right with God. If there's any question at all in your heart, whether you're right with God or not, you can walk out of this place this morning absolutely assured that your sins are forgiven and that you're right with God. And it is by confessing your faith in Jesus as your Lord. He is the only one, the Bible says, by which men can be saved. It is through the name of Jesus, because he shed his blood so that your sins would be forgiven and you would be restored in relationship with God. And if that's you this morning, I want to lead you in a prayer. And uh, just so that I can agree with you and celebrate with you, I'm going to ask that you just lift your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I'm praying that prayer with you today. To place my faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you, sir. See your hand. Thank you. See your hand as well. Anybody else? Thank you, sir. See your hand. Thank you, ladies. See your hands up front. Anybody else saying, hey, today, I'm making sure that I'm right with God. I'm placing my faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. Uh, I celebrate with you. Let's pray this prayer together. Would all of us join together and just repeat these words of prayer to him? Say, Father, thank you for loving me and sending Jesus to pay for my sins that I can know you again that I can be forgiven that I can be right with you that I can get back on track the purpose you created for my life so right now according to your word I confess with my mouth Jesus is my Lord I turn to you Jesus in faith I declare you are my Savior, and I trust in you for the forgiveness of my sins. Fill me with your spirit so I can live this new life you created me to live. And I pray this in the name, above all names, in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Amen. It's a great, great uh, way to encourage you in your decision today that you made for the Lord, okay? And I want to pray a blessing on you today.
So let's, uh, let's just lift our hands to receive the blessing of the Lord. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace yes. in His name. Amen. 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 Have a great day. Great week.